Imagine getting a job at a museum, and at night, everything comes to life. And Robin Williams is there too. Oh, and you're also Ben Stiller. So we start off seeing this guy, Larry Daly, run to his car just to find out a wheel lock has been attached. He tries to get it off, but he can't. So he runs to his son's school to get his son, Nikki, only to find out that his ex-wife, Erica, has already picked him up. He goes to meet Erica at her house, and he meets her new fiance, Don, at the house. He's a funny character. Anyway, Larry and Erica get talking, and he asks her if she thinks their son will like Queens. She goes, oh no, Larry, you didn't get evicted again, did you? She says she doesn't know how much more of this instability Nikki can take. It's not good for a child, and I agree. Larry says he's trying to figure things out, but you can tell he's not making much progress. With that, because he's just as broke as guys who bought NFTs this year, or last year, or the year before. Seriously, stop buying this stuff. Today's video is brought to you by NordVPN. These days, everyone's trying to snoop on you and your data. That's why it's important to use protection in all cases. I, for one, trust NordVPN to keep me browsing safely and freely. One of my favorite features is that if there's any content of any kind not available in your location, you can simply switch countries with the click of a button. Plus, you'll really throw your stalkers for a loop when they see you've suddenly traveled to Lithuania. With regards to cybersecurity, NordVPN features AES-256 encryption, recommended by the NSA, so you know they mean business. There's also a double VPN feature so you can be two layers deep into encryption. NordVPN even goes as far as to block phishing websites, scan downloaded files for viruses, block malware-ridden websites, and skip annoying pop-up and banner ads. We all hate ads, don't we? <laughs> Once again, thank you to NordVPN for sponsoring this video. I'm glad to share that they're offering four months free with their two-year plan. It's risk-free with Nord's 30-day money-back guarantee. If you value your privacy and safety and want to support the channel, be sure to follow the link in the description. It's nordvpn.com slash Min Movies. That's M-I-N Movies. She finally breaks it to him. She doesn't think Nikki should stay with him again, at least until he gets himself sorted out. Just then, Nikki shows up and they go play hockey. During the game, Nikki falls, and Larry, the father of the year, immediately jumps in to help his son up. He doubles as coach of the year because he also uses that opportunity to give his son some tactical tips before getting off the ice, but he gets a puck to the face for his troubles. After the game, Larry and Nikki are taking a walk back home, and Larry's talking about how good his son was, and how NHL is a possibility. But boom, Nikki says he doesn't want to play hockey anymore. Well, he's just a little boy still finding his way. Nothing to get worked up about, right? No problemo. But actually, yes problemo. Because he wants to abandon hockey to be a bond trader like Don. Now that's one way to bruise a man's ego. Another man took his wife, and now he wants to take his son too. Come on. But Larry plays it cool and presses on about hockey. Nikki says he likes hockey, but bond trading is his fallback. Fallback? What? Are you in your mid-30s or something? What do you mean fallback? Look at this lad who has barely made it to middle school talking about having a fallback. The only falling back you should be worried about is falling into bed every night. Larry asks him where he even heard that word and he says from mom. Apparently she's been talking to her fiance about Larry's different schemes and she thinks Larry needs a fallback. That breaks Larry's heart. Then Nikki straight up asks him if he's moving again and Larry says, we'll see. There's some pretty cool places down in Queens. The little boy's obviously crestfallen. Larry tries to get the boy's spirits back up. He tells him he really feels his moment is coming and when it does, everything will come together. In response to that, his son sends a dagger right through his heart. What if you're wrong and you're just an ordinary guy who should get a job? He asks. Larry is speechless. He just says they'll figure it out and they walk home. Tough. People would say that to me all the time before this channel took off. Look at me now. Still a loser. Huh. But he takes his son's words to heart and the next day he's at a job interview. The lady tells him his resume is pretty poor and she can't help him. He begs her for a job and then she sends him to some place, which has turned down everyone she has sent in the past. The place in question is a museum. There he meets Rebecca, who directs him to Cecile for the interview. But on their way, Rebecca introduces him to a pretty realistic Theodore Roosevelt wax figure on a horse. And then they meet Dr. McPhee, the museum director who expresses his displeasure with the chaos all around. Now we see Larry walk through a security door where he meets Cecile. He tells Larry that the museum is losing money, so it's downsizing. The guys at the museum want to fire Cecile and the two other night guards and replace them with one new guy. Larry meets the other night guards, Gus and Reginald, and you can instantly see why they have to be fired. But here's the thing, Larry didn't know that he was coming for an interview to be a night guard, so he says he wants to think it over. But they don't give him that time. What they give him is the job, right there. Cecile then gives him a tour of the museum. Along the way, Larry gets lost, and as he's looking for Cecile, he comes from behind in a costume and startles him. After having a good laugh, Cecile tells him, seriously though, no fooling around in here. This stuff's really old. They continue with the tour and finish at the Hall of African Mammals, where Larry notices a monkey and Cecile says his name is Dexter, and he's a ball of fun. And then the Temple of the Pharaoh. Cecile shows him the Pharaoh himself and his most prized possession hanging behind him, a 24 karat gold tablet. Mr. Beast has about a hundred of these. Larry found Cecile's reaction to the gold tablet and the monkey a little strange, but he didn't say anything. Take a mental note of this. Cecile tells him to report here at five tomorrow. 
tomorrow. He says cool. At home, he hangs up his uniform and calls Erica. He tells her he just got a job and she can tell Nikki that they will no longer be moving. Of course, she's excited about the good news. Tomorrow comes and Cecile and the gang hand over the keys and a torch to him. They advise him to strap them to his belt. Cecile tells him it gets spooky around here so he might want to put some lights on. Finally, he hands him the instruction manual and they tell him to follow the instructions numerically. Final word of advice they offer before they leave. Don't let anything in or out. Out? What do you mean out? Are these not all statues and wax figures? Do they come alive at night? What's going on here? Larry's about to have one hell of a night at the museum, but it starts out pretty calm actually. He first turns on the lights like he was advised to do. Then he plays around with the PA system, making all sorts of sounds on the speakers until he sleeps off. Pretty easy job, isn't it? He falls while he's sleeping and that wakes him up, so he decides to take a walk around the museum, but then he notices a door wide open. He thinks it's Cecile playing a prank on him, but instead what he sees is the skeleton of a dinosaur just chilling. Larry drops his torch and starts running. The dinosaur chases him. He tries to run out, but the door is closed shut, so he hides behind the counter instead and makes a call to Cecile who's busy having the time of his life at a party. Cecile just tells him to read the instructions. The dinosaur is really destroying the desk. It even picks it up and throws it away. Then Larry looks at the manual and the number one instruction is throw the bone. He picks up the bone, throws it, and the dinosaur goes to fetch. It comes back around and tosses the bone to Larry. Larry tosses the bone again and the dinosaur excitedly runs after it, not caring that it slammed Larry to the floor on its way. But while Larry is still on the floor, he looks up and sees an elephant walking, birds flying, a rhino, all sorts of things. He goes upstairs and sees cavemen walking all about. In fact, the entire museum is busy right now. This huge stone sculpture is talking to him and some men start chasing him. He runs into the elevator and manages to have some respite. He gets into a room and it's more peaceful here. Well, peaceful until it turns into a war zone. He runs out of the room and finally reads the next instruction. It says, lock up the lions or they'll eat you. He immediately goes to find where the lions are and gets directions from a bronze man who happens to be Christopher Columbus. He gets to the room where the lions are with other animals, the Hall of African Mammals. He's pushed into the room by an elephant and now he locks himself inside the room. Yes, with the animals. An ostrich, elephant, a couple zebras, and a deer start approaching him. So he just introduces himself briefly and makes a dash for the other door, just as the lions start approaching. While he's running, a monkey jumps on him, but he's able to make it outside the gate just in time. But he can't find his keys to lock the gate. So he reaches for the manual and number three says, double check your belt. The monkey probably stole your keys. Then he looks up and sees Dexter hanging on the gate with his bunch of keys. Dexter comes down and hands over the keys with a complimentary bite to the nose. He also pees on Larry for good measure as he locks the gate. Imagine getting a golden shower from a monkey. That reminds me, I need to delete my internet history. But Dexter's not even done with him. He snatches the instruction manual from Larry and starts tearing it up right in front of him. Larry contemplates going in to confront the monkey, but then the lions remind him why that's not such a good idea. How the hell is he going to survive without the manual? It's going to be a really long night and these small people shooting needles at him are not making it any more bearable. He now sees a bunch of little people in a little village singing and he moves to have a closer look. And while he's standing and watching, some little people gather around his feet, tie his legs together, and topple him over. He falls into the village and more of the little people gather and tie him up with his head lying on a rail. A man comes out and says, every night, year after year, one of you guards lock us up in these boxes, where I hereby say, sir, enough. Then another guy on a horse, Jedediah, says, fire up the iron horse, boys, and a train starts approaching. Larry begs Jedediah to stop the train, but he says no, because somebody has to pay. He instead instructs that the train run at full speed. It does, but the effect it produces when it collides with Larry's head is nothing more than a poke. Now, Larry realizes what power he has as a giant to these little people. He tears the rope he was bound with and stands up while all the little people scatter around. This must be what being Shaq feels like. He sits up only to find an army of Roman soldiers lined up and waiting for him. The leader, Octavius, instructs the soldiers to prepare their catapults. After a little back and forth, Octavius orders his army to shoot and they start hurling fire at Larry. It doesn't look like it's troubling him much though. But just then, Theodore Roosevelt appears and offers him a hand. Larry jumps on his horse and they storm off. He drops him off just at the foot of the atlas. They do their instructions and Roosevelt takes his gun and tells Larry to excuse him because the hunt is afoot. Larry follows Roosevelt and asks him the million dollar question. He asks, isn't everything in this museum supposed to be dead? And Roosevelt just asks Larry to follow him. He leads him to the tablet over the pharaoh and says that's the source of all this commotion. He says the tablet arrived in 1952 from the Nile expedition and the night it arrived was when everything in the museum came to life and it has come to life every night since then. Roosevelt tells Larry that his job is to make sure none of them leave the museum because if the sun rises and any of them are outside, they turn to dust. Anyway, it's almost done and Roosevelt tells him he'll help him restore order tonight for the first and last time. After that is done, we see Roosevelt watching this lady, Sacagawea, with his binoculars. I didn't know presidents have crushes, but I suppose that does make sense. Anyway, Larry comes and breaks up his stocking party and he tells Roosevelt he doesn't think he'll be coming back. But the president tells him, some men are born great, others have greatness thrust upon them. For you, this is that very moment. He leaves Larry with those words and goes to assume his position as a statue. But he makes sure to give Larry one last little scare before he leaves. As he turns to leave, he 
finds Jedediah in his pocket. He picks him up and takes him back to where he should be, just as the dinosaur goes back to assume his own position. Everybody else also assumes their position, and then the sun starts rising. A few moments later, Cecile and his gang show up at the museum to check if Larry is still alive. Larry comes out and asks them why they didn't tell him that his job was life-threatening. He immediately tells them he's no longer interested in the job, and he heads out. Just outside, he sees Nikki with Don. Don says he was taking the little boy to school, and he said he wanted to stop by at his dad's new job. He wants a tour, but Larry says today is not the day, but he promises he'll give him one someday. That alone is enough to make Larry rethink his decision, so he goes back inside and tells Cecile and the gang that he'll give it another shot, but he had barely completed his statement when Dr. McPhee called him with a query. He takes him straight to Jedediah's little village and asks him why one of the Roman soldiers has his head in a guillotine. Larry gives a reasonable explanation considering the events from last night, but Dr. McPhee thinks he's being funny. Anyway, that's all for now. So Larry runs out and asks Cecile if he has another copy of the instruction manual. He says no and just advises him to brush up on his history. He says that helped him out when he first started. Just as Cecile is leaving, Larry sees Rebecca giving some kids a tour of the museum and explaining everything to them. So he joins the pack of kids. When they get to Dexter, Rebecca says it's known for its loving and generous nature and Larry makes some type of noise like, yeah right. And when the kids leave, he goes to Dexter and tells him he might have them fooled, but he's not buying it. He tells the monkey there's a storm coming. Up next, they head to Sacagawea, Roosevelt's crush, and Larry asks if she's deaf. He asks because last night he tried to talk to her, but she couldn't hear him. But that was because of the glass, not because she's deaf or anything. But he didn't know that. At this point, Rebecca calls Larry aside and asks him what he's doing. He says he just wants to learn more about what he'll be guarding every night and offers to buy her a cup of coffee so she can tell him more. She says she'll see him in 20 minutes. Young man, you're supposed to be getting rested for another long night, not drinking coffee with a fine lady. But then again, who won't sacrifice sleep for a fine lady? I know I would, if given the chance, of course. We now see them taking a walk with their cups of coffee. And at first, the topic of discussion is Sacagawea, but it soon gets a little more personal. She tells him she's working on a dissertation on her, and he tells her he's divorced and has a 10-year-old son. After the mini date, we see Larry doing some research on the different characters at the museum. After his research, he's back at the museum, resuming for the second time. Cecile and the gang come over to tell him good luck and goodbye. They're clocking out for the last time and leaving town, just like my dad did when I was two years old. But just before they leave, Reginald makes a copy of the key. Now work starts and Larry seems better prepared than last night. He uses a toy car to place some fetch with the dinosaur, gives the cavemen a lighter as they try to discover fire, throw some gum to the stone sculpture guy, and then he heads to Jedediah and Octavius, who are still at loggerheads with each other. The Romans are trying to expand and Jed's folks are trying to blow a hole in their mountain. Larry tells them not to, but they go ahead anyway, and all they get is a little poof. So Larry takes out Jed and Octavius and asks them to talk. They say they just fight to pass time, really. Larry tells them to run around instead, but if they misuse their privilege, they'll end up locked up like the other guys over there. He then moves on to go lock the gate where the lions are. Dexter tries to steal his keys again, but he's already prepared for that. So all Dexter took was a bunch of toy keys. Larry makes sure to make fun of the monkey before he leaves. He now meets Roosevelt, who seems excited to see him. Then Larry catches him staring at Sacagawea, and as a good wingman, he tells the president to go talk to her. But the one-time leader of the free world is nervous. He could deliver speeches to millions of Americans, but cannot find the words to talk to one woman. Relatable. Anyway, we see someone take something and put it in a drawer. It's so dark though, so we don't know who that is. I suspect it's Reginald, but we'll see soon. For now, Larry is still doing his rounds. He approaches these men from a foreign town, and he entertains them with some magic tricks. They're so mind blown, but then one of the tricks goes wrong, and they're ready to tear Larry's limbs off because of it. However, he's saved by the trumpet, the trumpeting of elephants that is. They hear a bunch of animals run down towards them, and they leave Larry there and run away. Larry sees the animals approaching, and he gets up and runs away. Everybody is running. Why are you running? Larry runs into the room where Dexter is, and this time, the monkey successfully steals his bunch of keys. He chases Dexter, and on his way, he sees Jed's people and Octavius's people in a full-blown battle. Larry goes there to try and broker peace, but little does he know that he has bigger problems on his hands because Dexter has just used his keys to open the window. Literally everything is going wrong now. The cavemen whom Larry gave a lighter are currently on fire. He puts the fire out with an extinguisher, and how do they say thank you? By throwing the foam from the extinguisher right in his mouth and laughing at him. He wants to stay there a little longer and confront them, but he's reminded that Dexter is still with his keys, so he goes back to chasing. Meanwhile, one of the cavemen discovers the open window and jumps right out of it, but Larry is still there trying to steal his keys back from Dexter. The monkey gives him a slap on the face for his troubles, and it soon becomes a slapping competition which goes on and on until Roosevelt shows up to restore peace. He gives Larry a napkin to wipe off and asks for the keys from Dexter who hands it over without argument. You know what? I see why Americans voted for him. I would have voted for him too, just off this display. Anyway, Larry now gives up and tells Roosevelt that he can take over. Roosevelt tries to convince him, but he says he's done done, so he packs up his bags and starts heading for the door. On his way out, Columbus brings his attention to the open window. Larry goes over, looks down, and sees the caveman on the streets. He quickly dashes out to bring him back in, but he's too late. The sun comes out, and the caveman turns to dust before his very eyes. And right there, a truck runs over the dust, and it disappears. That's thousands.
thousands of generations wiped out just like that, if you get what I mean. He goes back inside and everything is back in their place. He retrieves the keys from Roosevelt's finger and finds his way. Moments later, Nicky comes into the museum with his friends and is boasting to his friends that his dad will hook them up. But it's pretty bad timing because, just as the kids make their way in, Dr. McPhee starts scolding Larry because of the mess the fire extinguisher made in the caveman's area. So right there, in front of his son and his friends, Larry gets fired. You can see Nicky's spirit being crushed in that moment. Larry follows Dr. McPhee and begs for one more night and he gets it, but his son is not there to see that he still has a job. McPhee tells him anything goes wrong tonight and he's off, for good. He leaves the museum and heads straight to Erica's house. She had called him to come around because of Nicky. He goes upstairs to see his son and asks him what's wrong and Nicky just straight up says, you got fired. Nicky tells him he was there when it happened and Larry explains to his son that he still has a job and it was just a misunderstanding. He tells Nicky he won't understand and then offers to show him. He tells him to come to work with him tonight. Before the boy can give a reply, Erica shows up and asks to have a word with Larry. She tells him that she loves that he wants to show Nicky what he does, but she doesn't think the boy has room in his heart for any more disappointment. But Larry assures her that he won't be disappointed. Oh, definitely not. He might end up dead, but definitely not disappointed. Now we see the boys head up to the museum. Larry gets suited up and he comes out to see Rebecca just sitting and staring at Sacagawea. This lady really has everyone staring, doesn't she? Anyway, Larry tells Rebecca she has to leave, so she gets up and gathers her things. As she's preparing to leave, he asks how her dissertation is going, and she says she has reached a dead end. She says her research can only take her so far. She'll never knew who Sacagawea really was, and in that very moment, you could tell what Larry was going to do. It took him a few seconds, but he eventually ran after Rebecca and told her to stay over and watch everything come alive at night. Then she can talk to Sacagawea and finish her dissertation, but she thinks he's making fun of her, so she turns around and leaves. Man has no game. Anyway, he has an audience already, so he focuses on giving them a good show. He sits Nikki down and tells him everything is about to come alive in a few seconds, but he counts down and nothing happens. He motions to the dinosaur. Nothing happens. So he goes to meet Roosevelt and tries to get him to wake up, but nothing. His son thinks he's going mad and just goes and tells him to stop, but Larry tells him there's a tablet that brings everything to life every time. So he goes upstairs to show him the tablet, and boom, it's missing. Nikki is not having any of this BS, so he heads downstairs. He tells his dad he's going home, but just then, they see Cecile and the gang. They'd put the tablet and a few other things in a trolley and were ready to cart away with it. Nikki grabs the tablet while Larry stands in between his son and the gang. He tells his son to turn the middle piece to see what he was talking about, but Cecile keeps telling him not to do it. Of course, the boy does what his dad says, and he can hear everything come to life. Cecile and the gang are now ready to beat Larry up for spoiling their operation, so he tells his son to run. He takes a pretty good beating from the old men, while they explain to him that they had to steal the tablet because they discovered that, like the museum, they came alive at night, and they weren't ready to let go of that life. They now start chasing Nicky. They find him and retrieve the tablet from him. Larry arrives shortly after, and Cecile steals the keys from his pocket and locks him and his son inside the pharaoh's place. But while Cecile was doing Dexter's job, Dexter was busy opening the front door for all the animals to go out. Locked in there, Larry yells out for Roosevelt to come and get him out. Roosevelt shows up, but he says he can't do anything. He tells Larry he has to finish the job this time. He can't quit. He infers that Larry is a better man than himself, himself being someone who actually wasn't really present or anything, but is just a wax figure of the real man. His final words to Larry were, I'm made of wax, Larry. What are you made out of? And he leaves. Just then, two gigantic Egyptian guards approach Larry and Nikki and try to attack them. So Larry runs to the pharaoh, who has been struggling to get out of his sarcophagus. He opens it, and the pharaoh gets his men to stop the attack. The pharaoh now gets up, unwraps his head, and is speaking some pristine English. Nikki asks him how he speaks English, and he says he went to Cambridge University. He introduces himself as Achman Ra, fourth king of the fourth king, ruler of the land of his fathers. And Larry introduces himself and his son in return. Achman Ra says he's forever in their debt, and then asks them to hand over the tablet so he can assume command of his kingdom. But here's the thing, they don't have it. Next thing we see, the door is blown open, and three men run out. They're welcomed with a very strange sight. Everyone is fighting. It's all chaos in the museum. Then the foreign guys from the last night sight Larry and run towards him. Larry also runs towards them. They meet in the middle, and it becomes a shouting competition. Surely Larry doesn't understand what he's saying, but he just keeps going. Luckily, Achman Ra understands their language, so he acts as interpreter. He tells Larry they're saying they want to rip him apart. Larry looks the big guy in the eyes, and tells him that he was ripped apart when he was a baby, and that's why he wants to rip people apart so bad. Larry brings his big man to tears, and they eventually hug it out. Wholesome. After the hug, Larry turns to the warring crowd and tries to get their attention, but it doesn't work. So his stone sculpture friend shouts, quiet, and everyone stops what they're doing to listen. Larry introduces Achman Ra to the people and tells them it's his tablet that brings them to life every night. He tells them the old night guard stole it, and they need to get it back before morning. He gives instructions to different groups and assigns them to different wings in the museum. He puts Octavius and Jed together, and they're not having it. But Larry quickly breaks that up. He tells them they're not that much different from each other. They're just both great leaders who want the best for their people. He gets his motivational speaker side going, and Roosevelt is smiling like a proud father, and Nikki like a proud son. He gets everyone on the same side, and they begin their search. Jed and Octavius with their people go outside to loosen the tires of Cecile's truck. Columbus and the Neanderthals confront Reginald, while the Civil War 
more soldiers surround Gus. Cecile, who has the tablet under his arm, is now looking for the rest of the gang. He opens the door to Ocean Life and the big fish in there. Is that a shark? Blows him away. But he manages to escape to his trunk with the tablet. While his friends have been tied up in the museum, Larry finds out the trunk is left and he says he knows someone who can help. So he runs straight to Sacagawea and smashes the glass demarcation. She asks him to help track Cecile. She comes out, feels the snow, and tells him Cecile went east and crashed. But it's not even such amazing work because the truck is literally right there. As they're still talking, they see Cecile come towards them from inside the museum on a chariot at full speed. He nearly crashes into Sacagawea, but Roosevelt appears at just the right time and saves her. Finally, he says some words to her, but he soon finds out he has been cut in half. Merely a flesh wound. Anyway, they still have a thief to catch before morning, so Larry gets on Roosevelt's horse, gets support from the dinosaur, and the pair of Jed and Octavius who are driving the toy car that the dinosaur's bone is attached to, and they all hit the road. But all his aides fall by the wayside. Jed and Octavius crash, and that automatically takes the dinosaur out too, so Larry has to do it all on his own. And he does. He gets the chariot to stop by uttering the code word, retrieves the tablet, and hands Cecile over to the foreign men. They beg for permission to torture Cecile a little, and Larry gives them the go-ahead. But there's a new problem at hand. Larry needs to get everyone back to the museum ASAP, because the sun will soon be up. There's no realistic way to do it, so he hands over the tablet to Achman Ra, tells him it's his tablet, and he knows the instructions, then tells him to get everyone back. Achman Ra says a few words, the entire tablet lights up, and everyone starts heading straight to the museum. Larry then places a call to Rebecca. She needs to see this. She's in her cab when she sees the bunch of animals heading back to the museum, and she starts smiling sheepishly. No pun intended. Okay, maybe a little intended. Sacagawea, by the way, did a good job putting Roosevelt back together. Now he's walking around. As he and Larry exchanging pleasantries, Rebecca comes in and just then, she sees Sacagawea and she's just starstruck. Larry introduces them and the ladies go off to have a conversation. Larry and Roosevelt are now taking stock of everything, and we see two zebras head into the Ark. Sorry, the Hall of African Mammals. Anyway, after taking stock, they think they lost Octavius and Jet, but as if on cue, we see them climbing up and walking towards the guides in slow-mo. They all head in together. As the sun is coming out, everyone is assuming their positions. Roosevelt says goodbye to the love of his life, and goes to mount his horse. He says goodbye to Larry, and says till tomorrow evening, and Larry just says he doesn't know about that. Roosevelt tells him if that's the case, then farewell. Then he calls out to Nikki, and tells him his father is a great man. The boy says he knows. How sweet. The whole museum is an absolute mess, but there's an even bigger mess. All the news channels are talking about the happenings from last night. The dinosaur tracks in the snow, the Neanderthals who were spotted outside, all that stuff. Dr. McPhee shows these things to Larry and asks him for an explanation. Of course, he has none. So McPhee asks for his torch and his keys and walks him out of his office. But as they get to the main hall, McPhee is met with the biggest crowd he has ever seen at the museum. So he just hands over the torch and keys back to Larry without saying a word and heads back inside. Larry throws a glance at Rebecca and they both smile at each other. That night at the museum was such a big win for Larry. Even bigger because his son is now so proud of him. He introduces his dad as the night watch guard at the Museum of National History on career day. The following night at work, it's a party. An absolute ball. Achman Ra's dancing. Columbus is playing football. Roosevelt is riding away with the love of his life. One of the cavemen is drinking fire extinguisher juice, while Jed and Octavius are playing fetch with the dinosaur, which Nikki is riding. What a night. But before we go, we see Cecile and the gang cleaning up the museum. I mean, I was going to ask who was going to clean up all that mess. Good thing they answered that question. Moral of the story? Robin Williams. Rip in peace, man. <laughs>